Well, it finally happened. After months of speculation, leaks, arguments, debates, rumours, conjugation and constipation, I finally made the trip on a rainy December night to my local cinema to experience the rise of Skywalker. The concluding part of the 40-year Skywalker saga, the resolution to the plot threads that have gripped absolutely no one since The Force Awakens, the desperate attempt to undo the nightmare of The Last Jedi, and the last chance to redeem Disney Star Wars in the eyes of the fandom. Never has so much rested on the shoulders of one movie. Never has the entire entertainment world held its breath in collective anticipation. But does it succeed in this most Herculean of tasks? <laughs> no. No, it doesn't succeed at all, in anything. The Rise of Skywalker is a complete, total and unmitigated disaster. A hollow shell of nothingness, with no heart, no soul and no meaning. To quote William Shakespeare, this movie is a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Rise of Skywalker is the ultimate expression of the creatively bankrupt culture among the big Hollywood studios, and further proof as if it was needed, that Disney is probably the worst thing to happen to Star Wars since the holiday special. We celebrate a day of peace. Ugh, make it stop! Anyway, there's a lot to talk about here, so that's all you're getting in terms of verbal lubrication on this one. Now it's time to go in hard and fast with my plot analysis. And yeah, needless to say I'm gonna spoil the shit out of this movie because I've got absolutely no respect for it. Also, there's so much to complain about that I'm actually going to have to split this review into multiple parts. There's just no way I can fit it all into one video without driving myself and you insane. So drink them if you've got them, because trust me, you're going to need it more than ever with this one. Let us begin, shall we? So Rise of Skywalker begins about a year after the events of The Last Jedi. The First Order are busy taking control of the galaxy, while the Resistance is desperately trying to rebuild its shattered forces. But then a transmission starts coming in from the Sith homeworld, located somewhere in the Unknown Regions. Wow, these Unknown Regions are pretty versatile when it comes to script writing, aren't they? I mean, isn't that the same place the First Order came from? Were they aware of the Sith homeworld? And why are they so unknown? Why has no attempt been made to explore them? It's like a box, you see. A box filled with mysteries. <laughs> Anyway, the transmission is coming from Emperor Palpatine himself. You remember him, don't you? The guy who got blasted with his own force lightning and thrown down an elevator shaft into the core of an exploding Death Star. Now, you might think that would be bad news for most people, but the script is like, nah, it'll be fine, he's still alive. So everything that happened in Return of the Jedi has been rendered invalid. Vader's sacrifice, Luke's defiant last stand, it's all gone now. <laughs> Fuck off, film. In fact, on that subject, we're gonna play a little game here. Every time I describe something in this plot that sounds totally incongruous or contrived or just plain dumb, take a shot with me and we'll see how many of us make it to the end of the review. Anyway, Kylo Ren is mad about this new development because he's the supreme leader now and he's not up for sharing. So he goes to a place and kills a bunch of people so he can get hold of a MacGuffin called a Wayfinder, one of only two in existence which points the way to the Sith homeworld of Exogul. Because apparently it's really hard to find and you need a Wayfinder to find the way. However, this does bring up a number of questions for me. Like, who constructed these devices, and for what purpose? Why would you want to show the way to a secret world? If Exogul is the Sith homeworld, wouldn't there be literally millions of people who know the way there by now? Is it possible to duplicate the Wayfinders? They seem to be technological rather than magical in nature, so I assume there's nothing too special about them. Why aren't there more of them? If you need to physically take the Wayfinder with you, and there's only two of them, does that mean that only two people can ever go to Exogul? And how did Palpatine get to Exogul without a Wayfinder device of his own? Writing is hard, isn't it, JJ? 
So he plugs the Wayfinder into his TIE Fighter and uses it as a fucking sat-nav and so he goes there alone. Because it makes sense to just blindly walk into a completely unknown situation with no backup or means of calling for assistance. I mean, what if he got there and there was an entire army waiting for him? What if he got blasted out of the sky the moment he arrived? But the script is like, nah, it'll be fine. So he arrives and he goes inside a giant black cube and yup, there's Palpatine. And for some reason he looks younger than he did 30 years earlier. I don't know, maybe the makeup people didn't know what the fuck they were supposed to be doing at this point. Which wouldn't surprise me considering how many different versions this film went through. Anyway, so Palpatine explains that Snoke and the whole First Order were just puppets that he created and he's been secretly pulling the strings here for the past 30 years while also building up a massive overwhelming fleet of Star Destroyers which he now calls the Final Order. <laughs> And then he smiles and hundreds of Star Destroyers rise up out of the icy surface of the planet and fly up into the sky in perfect formation. <laughs> what. The. Fuck. Why were they stored under the ice on a planet that's practically impossible to find anyway? How were they built down there and wouldn't it cause massive damage to break them free like this? If you were already working on this massive fleet, what was the point in creating Snoke in the First Order at all? And what about Starkiller Base? Was that part of your plan? If that wasn't your real plan, weren't you just drawing unnecessary attention to yourself and potentially mobilising the entire galaxy against you before you were ready to strike? You'd never guess the plot of this movie was desperately cobbled together out of the ruins of The Last Jedi, would you? Anyway, so Palpatine orders Kylo to find Rey and bring her to him. Because obviously, when you're dealing with armadas of ships numbering in the thousands and the conquest of hundreds of solar systems across an entire galaxy, one girl is clearly going to make all the difference. <coughs> <coughs> Fuck off, film. Speaking of everyone's favourite Mary Sue, she's hanging out on a jungle planet with CGI Princess Leia doing Jedi training. Not Luke of course, Leia. Because we can't have a woman taking instructions from a man in 2019 can we? That's not allowed. Anyway, she's getting even more powerful than before, cause obviously she needed it. Now she can literally float in midair, leap across massive chasms and fight training droids on a tightrope with her eyes closed. Well, that's definitely shite. <laughs> you know one of the reasons people never warm to Rey is because she comes across as totally overpowered and invincible, right? Ah oh, well, at least she's been shown doing actual training for a change, so that's something. Baby steps, JJ. Baby steps. But then she gets mad because she can't hear the voices of all the other dead Jedi in her mind. Holy shit, there's something Rey can't actually do yet? Yeah, no wonder she's pissed. If you've spent your entire life being able to master every new skill instantly, I suppose minor inconveniences like this are gonna seem like insurmountable obstacles by comparison. Anyway, then Poe and Finn show up in the Falcon with news from a First Order spy about Palpatine and his fleet of bullshit Star Destroyers. Who could this spy possibly be, considering there's only one senior First Order character that's been in all three movies up to this point? Nah, it's a total mystery to me. Great work, JJ. Keep it up. Anyway, the word on the street is that Palpatine is planning to unleash his copy-pasted fleet in 14 hours time. Why 14 hours instead of just right now when there's absolutely nothing stopping them? Don't know. Although if I had to guess, I'd say it's because the script wants to establish a sense of pace and urgency by giving us an arbitrary time limit to work against. The clock's ticking people, go go go! So the Rebel Command meet to discuss their next move and for some reason Maz Kanata is there. I guess she's resolved that labour dispute which was apparently more important to her than the fate of the entire fucking galaxy. Shite. Oh and Rose Tico's there too. And that's pretty much the scale of her involvement in this movie, thank god. At least JJ listened to that piece of feedback. So what will our plucky band do about all this? Well, in order to leave the unknown regions and launch their attack on the galaxy, the Sith fleet have to use a navigation tower. So if they can blow up the tower, the fleet will be stuck there forever. Because I guess they couldn't ever build a new one or something. <coughs> Fuck off, film. But how to get to Exegul in the first place when they don't even know where it is? 
Well, Rey looks through the old Jedi text she stole and finds a note from Luke about a second Wayfinder. It turns out he was looking for it himself, but then he gave up because it was too hard or something. Wow, that was lucky. It's also lucky there happens to be two of them, otherwise these chumps would have absolutely nothing to go on. Anyway, Luke's clues led him to a desert planet where he was looking for a Sith dagger that would give the location of the Wayfinder. Jesus Christ, this is like the puzzle tree on a Resident Evil game. And if it seems like an awful lot of pointless, convoluted busy work to you, then congratulations, you're clearly a better writer than J.J. Abrams. But basically it boils down to this. Find the dagger, find the Wayfinder, get to Exegol and blow up the thing. And Bob's your mother's brother, it's done. So they go to the planet and there's a big festival going on, and they run into Lando Calrissian, who explains he came here with Luke to find an assassin who was seen with the dagger. But when Luke gave up, Lando just kind of hung around, I guess. Oh yes, that's shite. And he's been here for the past 30 years or something. Like, why? What were you doing here all this time, you absolute plank? Why didn't you leave with Luke? Why were you even interested in Sith daggers when you've never had anything to do with the Jedi or the Force? Aren't you supposed to be Han Solo's friend? <coughs> Fuck off, film. So they're dicking around at the festival when Kylo Skype calls Rey. Wait, I thought it was Snoke who made these conversations happen. I thought the sheer mental strain of doing something like this would kill them. Nah, whatever. It's just a thing now and it can happen. So because they can somehow physically interact with each other during these moments, Kylo is able to figure out where Rey is. So he dispatches a small, easily defeatable force of stormtroopers to attack them. Just like in Force Awakens. Why employ the massive army you have at your disposal when you can just send one squad instead. Maybe they have to keep their fuel costs down or something. But honestly, I think the whole thing was done so they could have a goofy chase scene with even worse dialogue. Fly now! They fly now? They fly now! Yes, they fly now, you dick. They've been doing it for decades, in fact. So anyway, they blow up the troopers, but then they land in a patch of quicksand and they all get sucked down to their deaths. And with no one left to stand in their way, the Sith end up conquering the entire galaxy. Nah, just kidding. Instead, they somehow fall into an underground tunnel beneath the sand. Wait, what? How can you fall through sand into a tunnel which is beneath the sand? Wouldn't the sand collapse on the tunnel because there's nothing to hold it up? Because if there was something to hold it up, then you wouldn't be able to fall through it. Honestly, this movie is fuel for a thousand hours of EFAP. Then they run into a giant snake monster that looks like it wants to eat them, but it turns out it's just injured or something, so Rey uses the force to heal its wounds and off it goes. Oh yeah, you can trade your life force to heal injuries now, that's a thing which can happen. Keep it in mind because it'll be important later. So they find the bullshit dagger that'll lead them to the bullshit wayfinder that'll point the way to the bullshit navigation tower, but oh no, the directions are inscribed with Sith language, and only C-3PO can read it because language is his thing, I guess. But his programming won't allow him to do it. What is this thing, the Ring of Sauron or something? Oh yes, that's shite. So the only way to get around this problem is to go to yet another planet where a guy can do a thing so that 3PO can read the dagger. Ugh. This is fucking abuse. Why are you making this so difficult, JJ? Why do you hate us so? Anyway, they can't take the Falcon with them because it's been captured by the First Order, so instead they take the Assassin's abandoned ship that's been sitting out in the desert for decades, and somehow it's still fully functional and intact. How? Why did no one steal it before now? The Mandalorian leaves his ship for like two hours and it's been stripped down to its skeleton by then. Ah, whatever. So they're trying to get the ship up and running, but then Rey goes for a walk, and Chewie goes after her, but then he gets captured because he's an idiot now, I guess. Then Kylo Ren shows up in his TIE fighter, and Rey does her ridiculous Matrix-style leap, which causes it to crash and blow up. Holy shit, Kylo's dead, man! But then the script is like, nah, he'll be fine. He gets out of the wreckage like nothing happened. Then the First Order transport takes off with Chewie on board, and Rey's like, nah, that's my Wookiee. So she pulls it back down with the power of the Force, because she's that strong now. I'd like to point out that Yoda had to work his ass off just to lift an X-Wing out of a swamp. But of course, Rey is so much better than everyone else. 
I, uh, I think I can smell shite. But then Kylo gets involved too, and they have a fucking tug of war over this ship. And honestly, it was visually one of the most farcical things I've ever seen. It's like when they were fighting over Luke's lightsaber, but bigger. Because bigger is better, isn't it, JJ? Then Rey gets mad and shoots it with force lightning and it blows up. Holy shit, Chewie's dead, man! Also, where have I seen this kind of ability before? So anyway, they run away and Rey's sad because she killed Chewie and she's like, I'm an asshole, and I was like, yeah, you are. Anyway, I'm gonna have to bring part one of my review to an end right there because honestly, it's starting to make my brain hurt already. From a writing point of view, the first act of this movie is an utter nightmare. It feels like it was written by a 13 year old with ADHD. The narrative jumps all over the place, kicking our characters from one planet to another with no real explanation for why they have to go there or what's even happening. And it's all just pointless busy work when you get down to it, created purely to eat up screen time and give everyone something to do. But if you think this is bad, believe me, it only gets worse from here. Stay tuned for part two, but until then, go away now.